So um, we're going to talk about leveraging data, making the use of the agency and organizational information that we have. i uh, got a great panel here today, um, and I'll let them introduce themselves. So why don't we start out talking about the organizations you folks are from, a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your mission, and um, you know how you've been leveraging advanced analytics today. So Peter, why don't you kick us off there? Good morning. My name is Peter Kovac. I work for the Office of Financial Research in the Treasury Department. Uh, we were founded by Dodd-Frank to uh, perform both um, financial research and uh, a data mission involving data quality, data standards, um, those sorts of things. My, my, my team manages our clustered systems, our Hadoop systems, our traditional grid systems, databases, um, development and analytics, analytic tools, those sorts of things. Hi, I'm Jess Kahn. I'm the director of data and systems for Medicaid and CHIP. For the US. So I have the joy of collecting data from 56 states, territories in the district and trying to make them look, feel, and smell like a single data set. Um, but Medicaid um, covers over 73 million Americans for health insurance. That is more than Medicare. Um, though combined, Medicare, Medicaid, and marketplace is about three out of four Americans, and clearly. Um, we have a large footprint, so the data spans everything from beneficiaries to claims, managed care data, provider data, who else has payment liability. It's a pretty rich data set on a broad swath of Americans accessing healthcare. Hi, I'm Rahul Farshi, CTO of Zoom Data. Zoom Data is a technology company uh, headquartered in Reston, Virginia. Our main mission is to uh, enable a world where people make data informed decisions. And so, our goal from a product perspective is to really enable that self-service access to data and, and have uh, more of that democratization of data as, as folks um, adopt modern uh, data infrastructures and really transform what is typically their BI infrastructure and um, how they use data in their day-to-day. -day. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeff Thomas. I work at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. We are a national research lab. Uh, primary focus is systems engineering for uh, various DOD components. I tell folks my day job is really the cybersecurity program there where I oversee our uh, cybersecurity efforts. Uh, over the past couple of years, I've had the opportunity to also serve as our emerging technology program manager. Our CIO is very uh, keen on merging cyber and emerging tech, and so he sees it as a good match. So I've been working a lot with our big data and other areas that we do uh, at the lab for our enterprise IT efforts. Terrific. So lots of great depth here for our conversation. So let's, um, let's talk about some of the impactful ways um, each of you have implemented applications or systems where you know, you're leveraging the information. Those could be cost savings. They could be just improved services. Um, anything that comes to mind, who'd like to kick it off. I'll jump in. Right. Um, so Medicaid's been around 51 years in January. Um, and uh, we are really only now getting our hands on a timely and operational data set. Um, because it's federally funded largely and regulated, but state administered, it's not our primary data source, um, that's been a challenge. And of course, harmonizing the data, as I said, has been a challenge. But when you bring that data together, as we're now doing, you can answer questions like, where are people getting care and for what cost and with what service pattern? And in case you're curious like why this would matter, Medicaid pays for over half of all births in the United States. In some states, it can be two out of, um, three out of four births. It depends on the poverty rate. And we also pay for more than half of long-term care, um, which is obviously growing in the country. So understanding that experience of care and the costs and what is it like in a fee-for-service versus a managed care world, um, a lot of interest of late, you may have noticed, unless you've been in a... Uh, island without technology for the past few years. A lot of interest right now on healthcare and healthcare service delivery and the cost of healthcare and the policies. So really to have this be a data-driven conversation about those policies and um, what's happening now, it brings it really to the forefront. So, um, but just as like a, a, a quick, easy example of the kinds of things you can do when you have a national data set like that, 
aside from looking at trends across the country for utilization and opioids is also a big a, a point of emphasis for us. Um, there is a program that's called Lifeline that the Federal Communications Commission runs. It qualifies people for free cell phones or Wi-Fi if they have Medicaid or food stamps. And so all you have to do to be eligible is to participate in one of those two programs. Well, it, rather than ask people to prove that they participate in one of these programs, which is largely a paper-based process, which we're here talking about technology and data, so let's just all posit that paper's bad, um, you would want to be able to find a source of all the enrollment data that you could query and in real time, um, and now we're it. And so for the first time ever, we're having really great conversations with, with the FCC about how can we leverage our data set on who's currently enrolled in Medicaid so that they want to qualify someone in real time online the way all of us interact with the internet now. Um, they would be able to do so with a high degree of program integrity and at a much lower cost. And so we're talking about you know, putting an API in our data warehouse. That would never have happened before all the phone companies had to run this locally. Or the FCC could have a data use agreement and a data exchange with the same 56 states, territories, and the district. And we all can imagine the joy um, that that would bring. Well, it might make lawyers happy, but it wouldn't probably make everybody else happy. <laughs> Making lawyers happy, yeah. Um, <laughs> we're going to keep moving on from that one. How about you, Peter? So. Uh, OFR is a, is a relatively small office, and we have a, a really broad uh, array of subject matter areas where we get data and where we analyze data. Um, and, and it's uh, traditional technologies make uh, joining and finding insights across data sets difficult. If you're using a traditional relational database model, uh, major joins across large data sets on disparate servers is, is very computationally expensive, very slow. Um, and so the, sort of the cost of first insight is very high. Um, with, uh, with clustered systems and some of the distributed technologies that we're here talking about, um, we can reduce that a whole lot. I can present uh, a wide variety of data sets um, in sizes from 200 terabytes to 200 kilobytes in the same platform, and I can allow my users to, uh, to join and, and otherwise analyze in ways that, without a lot of IT or other, other data professional help, that they couldn't do otherwise. Right? If I have a new, a new insight, a new question, a new, a new project that I'm trying to consider the feasibility of, the, I can just do it. I, I can go in and join and, and do other, other exploratory analysis uh, on my default, my big di sort of data lake, data warehouse, uh, without the cost that you normally incur. I don't have to set up a new environment. It's just immediately available, which allows us to go through new ideas very quickly and, and get to the one in 100 or one in 1,000 that's really, really impactful. Excellent. So I would, uh, I would put it in different hats because I have <laughs> different uh, responsibilities. So uh, from the emerging tech side, I would say, you know, what are we trying to do? Well, first is from an organizational perspective, you know, we have central IT and then our business areas have their IT. And really big data presented an opportunity where um, folks had not focused before. And so <clears throat> what's traditionally happened is we've been an HPC shop, high performance computing shop. And those sector ITs have kind of managed their own. And so we saw an opportunity to say, look, let's look at the cost of this. If big data is becoming the new norm, you know, we can't have these clusters spinning, spinning up across the enterprise. It's not going to be um, practical or effective. Let's, let's consider a central kind of capability. And so we, we stood that up. And so one thing is, you know, how do we get that up and running for folks who want to use it from our business areas? They can come on board. And in fact, the, the best way we we gain traction with this from the businesses to reach out to a business area and say, look, we have a cluster. Can we work with you to get your data? And so we took one of their sponsor products and, and moved it on. And so that's been a good business case of, okay, how can we leverage this and make computing better for the enterprise? From the cyber perspective, um, you know, we use the traditional tools, the SIMs and all that, and they're just not keeping up with uh, what our defensive cyber operations folks want to do. You know, they're, they're trying to move away from signatures. They want to do more behavioral-based tracking users. So one unique example there is from all of our endpoints, we collect uh, network connection activity from those systems. We're then pulling those back to keep a store of all the places that a computer might visit. And then across that data, we then say, okay, what's the uniqueness of a particular website or IP address across the enterprise? Is this something we, as an enterprise, someone visits uh, all the time? Is it this is the one time we've only seen it and that's been the last, you know, within the last six months or so? So we're, 
we're trying to find a unique way to kind of um, stop the adversary and look at behaviors across the enterprise. Third bucket is more financial based. We're starting to now see folks who are saying, hey, we got this traditional data warehouse. Uh, data's in there, but I'm somewhat constrained. Uh, you know, a lot of, I said, our sector folks are IT focused. They're computer scientists. They have the skills and backgrounds, and they're coming forward and saying, let's just put some data in there. Let's, um, you know, make the data free. Let us do what we want to do with it and get, get the knowledge or information out that we want to, rather than being given these pre, pre prescribed uh, sets of data. So interesting, we have, we all can get our news of choice to the day and you had mentioned more, you know, healthcare is mm -hmm. one of the headlines. There's countless headlines today, today especially, financial. Never a day without cyber. Um, Rula, one of the things you had mentioned was democratization of data too, right? Mm -hmm. So, so to folks who are who are getting started, or we have people in in various stages of the journey here, right? What what recommendations can you folks make to those people about how to provide this kind of uh, information for everyone to to improve their their way of of professional life? At? Right. I think a lot of that stems from recognizing that. Data can be utilized as part of an ecosystem, an ecosystem that just you know, thrives on creating new data products, um, uh, crafting and, and enabling users to, to do what they need to do to, to enable that um, uh, new insight or area of relevancy to come to fruition. Um, and then what you'll see from that is a lot of new use cases or ways of using the data in, in, in methods that haven't been um, shaped before. Um, a lot of our customers, they are either uh, enabled by having more data available at a single point in time. For example, those who are constrained by maybe a, a, a traditional data warehouse, they've now moved either new, new use cases to a new modern platform, or they're also enabling the troves, the treasure troves of data that they have archived off because it wasn't just per, you know, performant enough to keep that within the warehouse and available. They're able to get new insight out of, out of having all of that data available now in, in quantities that never were before imagined. And then um, they're, they're really challenged um, t as an organization to start to think differently about how they enable that. Uh, security is always a big concern, but now that they've got more data available, they need to get it out there to the user constituency, and that more than likely is, is usually not a tech problem. It's more of a problem of policy and people that, that needs to kind of come into play along with the technology to, to really enable this as a, as a change driver for the organization. Excellent. A lot of, lot of head nodding on like, keeping data long enough there. What, what other suggestions can we make to folks on, who are on this journey? Peter, have any? Uh, involve business security process folks really early on in the phase. I think the, a lot of the, the, the ways you accomplish some of the, the performance benefits and some of the, uh, the downstream impact benefits is, is to use parallelization, right? The way we get uh, insights out of big data is we split it up and we, we process it on multiple systems. Um, and that, that thought model, that operational model, is enough different from a traditional model to make a lot of the, the existing process you have for uh, accrediting systems, for, for managing process, and for, for troubleshooting um, a, a bit different. And so one of the, the, the things that you've can delay or otherwise cause problems is if you're only focusing on your systems team or only focusing on your development team and setting up one of these solutions and then you go and get say, all right, I'd, I'd like to productionalize the system and your security team doesn't know how to vet a 50-node cluster um, or the process it takes a week per machine and you've got 100 machines, uh, it makes things a lot difficult. So generally uh, exposing and, and training staff outside of purely the systems and technology division um, involving them early on, I think, is, is pretty important. I would say I think that's a great point. The way we've kind of done it is, um, you know, we, we run a program, but uh, what we do is actually pull folks from different areas within the IT organization as part of this big data team. So we have developers, um, we have security folks, we have database admins, and they, they're the ones that have kind of come together to, to be our big data team so that we do get that 
kind of, hey, everyone sees what's going on. We know security is important. If we're going to put a certain type of data on this platform, we need to have encryption. We need to have rule-based access. We need to do all the things. And everything's on the same page as we march forward through the, you know, the IT process of getting a, a new product into production. I might take it a slightly different path, but let me just check, even though I'm slightly blinded. How many of you in your jobs are data users? In your jobs? Okay. So that's where I would start. What drives me bonkers is when somebody comes to me with an IT solution and asks me if I have a problem. I have a problem. Drives me nuts. So I would start with, what is it that your business, your program is trying to achieve? How often do they need that data? What's their data, their data use experience? I have people who are policy wonks, who need help with their Outlook email, all the way to people who are data scientists. So I need to have a, a, a a spectrum available to them that allows them to participate in this process and use the data. And half the time, y'all don't even talk about data. Like, just wipe that word from your vocabulary and just, you heard Carol sit here. She's looking for fraud and abuse, right? She's looking for somebody who's giving cancer drugs to someone who doesn't have cancer. That's not a data discussion. That is a program policy discussion about what we're trying to do with our work and therefore, I give Carol my data so that she can do that. And I, we talk about what's there and what's not there. But I'm not giving it to her just because she's the OIG and she has the right to ask me to, though actually that's true. Uh, <laughs> I'm giving it to her because I want her to catch the bad guys. And I want to give the same data to my policy colleagues who want to make sure that the way that people are structuring care um, for people in long-term care settings who need home and community-based care is the best way to do it. And so they could learn from how other states have done it and see what's the better pattern. So I would say start with the actual data users and build your use cases and then build your infrastructure behind that. We put all of our data in the cloud, first time at CMS to have PHI in the cloud. We put it in the cloud because I want people to use it. I separated the storage from the utilization discussion, though I ended up with the same solution that makes me happy for both. But nonetheless, our alternatives analysis considered them separately. And, but we want people to use it. Somebody mentioned beforehand, if it takes you a week to get a query, well, I've lost that policy analyst. She'll never log back into my dashboard ever again. So I need things that can move real time very quickly. And with the size of data that we're talking about from all of the states, I mean, just our friends in California give us 900 million records a month, um, never mind everybody else. Uh, we need to be able to move that rather quickly. So I would start with the user stories, and I would start with building the tools out that they um, say that they need, user-centric design for data and data tools. Um, oftentimes, people come and shop products to me. If you're looking me up on LinkedIn, please don't email me and shop me with data products because what I start with is what the needs are and then I go out and see what data products are available or what we can and can't do rather than the other way around. Um, so I, I actually feel pretty evangelical, in case you can't tell though I've had two cups of coffee, um, but I feel pretty evangelical about this because um, I work in a large government agency that has many people doing data and many people doing IT and uh, you know, they don't always talk, um, and there's a lot of solutioning without a lot of um, brainstorming and strategic planning. We had a, a pretty good conversation okay. earlier on, too, about uh, just, just the notional difference between things that are transformational versus things that are informational, right? And so a lot of people are making the move for economic reasons, but they're rebuilding an information. They're not transforming government. I think, you know, to the point of, mission centricity, right, that's transformational. That's going to make better government. That's going to make better performance within anyone's organization and by, by pulling this information. And you had hit a little bit on some labor resources and, and Peter, you had talked about some compliance with security guidelines and some other things. So, um, you know, to your point, it's a lot more than technology. Right, mm -hmm. so there's business processes involved here. There is, you know, there's personal personnel where there's project management. There's executive support, um, finance, budget. Anybody got a budget out there? We got. We could use one of those too. Um, so so let, let, let's talk about that a little bit. What what can we guide people on non-technical issues? If you had to do it over again, which step would you not skip? 
or who would you get on board to either accelerate or make something successful in your deployment? So, so maybe I'll kick it off from, from one of the commonalities we see um, with a lot of our, our implementations, especially within the federal government. It's usually the first time there's like this perfect storm of modern platforms and and new models that require upfront vetting with security and everything like that, but it really does stem from the business and the business recognition or the mission recognition that this is, this is a first of its kind thing for the, the, the agency or organization or department. They're thinking differently. And so they're not going to the, all the pre-vetted IT stack that's already there and composing a technology solution that's going to, you know, need a, you know, some tangible need. They're, they're, they're really trying to go outside of that box and enable change. And with that, yeah, you've got to get the right people at the table early on to bring all of that together. You've got to get the people on the mission side. You got to get the people on the technology side. You got to get the people on the compliance side, from security down through organizational policy, and that usually makes like the most successful uh, team implementation. Where things go awry is if it's kind of you know spearheaded by one or the other. But the the you're getting these the the, the right people at the table late, later on. That that re usually results in project deadline. You know, missing project deadlines, extending timeframes for these implementations. That kind of yeah, certainly adoption will go effect. up, right, if, if people participate right. early on. Right. What I would, other? I would add. Uh, Circle back. Oh, please. I was going to say, I, I would add one of the other uh, big pieces that I'm, I'm seeing that's uh, critical is uh, communications. Uh, even though, you know, we've, we've kind of started out, as, as you said, on this new endeavor, it's new to folks, even in the IT space, as well as the business. And so there's this constant communication. You know, you, you asked your question, I thought of the... Um, the movie Glengarry Glenn Ross with Alex Baldwin is like always be selling, right? So you kind of always got to be out there keeping people on the ball about, hey, you know, here's some benefits. We, we're getting these small wins and, you know, this is what we can do and this is where we can, we can take it. So it's kind of a constant uh, message out to executives and other folks that, you know, we're doing good things here and, and keeping them uh, focused. Circling back to your point, which I think is pretty critical, Thinking about what the what the end state, what the goal is um, before you start talking to IT. Um, uh, I work a lot with engineers, and we are all guilty of loving our tech. Um, you get evangelist Apple versus Windows, Vim versus uh, versus Emacs, um, and you, it when it's con it's really easy to let a really bright engineer drive a project, but no technology, no solution is perfect. Uh, no matter what it is, there's no silver bullet, and if you don't keep in mind and start from some base principles of this is where I'm trying to go, this is what I'm trying to accomplish, what are my users actually trying to do, what's the mission, um, you'll end up with a really lovely, really fast performance system that has three users, right? and then no one's happy. Yeah. Um, so we usually start with a, a policy strategy, like business needs strategy, what we're trying to achieve, and then we shape an acquisition strategy, or if there are internal resources, we certainly support enterprise um, shared services. Uh, but I do think the staffing piece is the Achilles heel for most government, though I'm pretty admirable of what sounds like some people's IT shops around here. Um, but they, they, it is hard. You can um, contract often easier than you can hire, and we have to compete with um, a lot of really smart people to get the data scientists to work in civil service. So if you're interested in sort of an internal Peace Corps-like experience, I would definitely recommend coming to work to government because the impact is huge. Um, and we really need some of the best of, uh, minds to work with us on our, on our data. Um, but that's, again, once you've got your contracts and your vision in place and your governance and hopefully your budget, um, that remains a struggle for us. There's so much work to do and there's only a certain finite number of people and you always get yanked off because somebody in the Congress wants this piece of data or the press or whatever, so it's hard to keep the steady strain. So I appreciate the question about all the operational pieces that go into it and underpin the vision. Yeah, it's, it's um, one of the things that um, we find over and over again is that, that people underestimate their own people and the resources they have, where a data scientist knows labor is critical to the success, 
but the institutional knowledge that people already have about their information is of great depth and value, right? So lots of times we've had these conversations and, and it's come up uh, a couple times already, like let's talk about letting people add the information, right? Let's just bring it together because a lot of people won't even bring it together without a specific outcome in mind, yet there are transformational things happening when people who have institutional knowledge with a little additional talent can get at information. You know, can you guys share some experience to talk about times where there were successes that you wouldn't have had otherwise or how you got more people bought into the project or just let them add the information and create a, a whether it be a data lake or you know, some data repository for people to go at? Anyone want to take a shot at that? Without going too, too specific into the project, I think the uh, financial research involves financial data, we all know this, and tabular data and financial data in particular is, is very paralyzable, right? A anything that I'm doing is, with a few edge cases is highly embarrassing parallel and performance improvements uh, are vast. And so uh, once we've got the trust of our users, once we, we, we've spent some time and moved them onto some of our clustered systems, we can get some, some pretty significant performance improvements. Um, project that took two weeks on a user's workstation, moved down to 20 minutes with some code improvements and moving to a, a multi-processing system. Right, so I think the, specifically for agencies that sort of smell like mine um, and have really nicely uh, shardable data, uh, you, you generally can, can get some pretty, inform, pretty impressive improvements. I would say our, you know, ours may, may be a little different than a time reduction. You know, as I said earlier, we're enterprise IT folks, and so we're concerned with running systems and keeping things going for the business. But you know, where we're starting to branch out into is supporting our, our sponsor-driven efforts. And so the, the cluster and data that we've um, started out on was really driven from the, the business side. And they asked us uh, you know, a question. You know, we do this research for our, for our sponsor. It was related to cybersecurity. You know, we may need to take this out and put it into one of their um, infrastructures monitoring on the internet. And so the question was, you know, how do we go from research to operations? Can you guys help us? And so just, just working and providing them what it would take to do that and then implement it and see the outcomes and uh, results, you know, goes all the way back to the sponsor getting a, a better product from us because they get the, not just the research side, but the operational impact to do something, what it'll take, how it can be done. Excellent. Anything like that? I think um, on, on our side, it, there's, there's nothing that gives me more satisfaction than a user getting in and getting access to their data and then being able to actually make sense of it. And I think there is a lot of need for the advanced skill sets and the, and the, the, the things that you know, can be um, really, really highly valued there. But I wouldn't underestimate just the power of getting um, someone who's familiar with the domain, understands the data that they're working in, in desktop space spreadsheets or other kinds of of information, they know that data, and you can really count on them. It might be a heuristic method that they're applying to, to, to get those insights, but when they've got access to the data, they really can do a lot uh, of good with that in a very, very short amount of time. Um, we've had uh, uh, implementation where, where customers have taken, enabled some access to the data, and done that for specific projects and systems, but then they start to go into a little bit more of an ad hoc mode in enabling additional user groups to have access to the data. And they might do that through some internal data hackathons or other things. And it's always amazing to me how quickly someone can get started when you take an analyst who knows the domain of the data and just say, here's, here's your data. This is this attribute. This is this element. This is this piece. And they really go to town, starting to ask questions and formulate answers. And seeing that workflow and seeing that happen is incredibly gratifying to, to me. But also, um, there's very little data science involved at times in terms of uh, incorporating a machine learning algorithm or some of the advanced computational things. So I wouldn't underestimate that aspect of enablement uh, for the users as well. 
I've seen it too. I've seen we had a, a customer do a, a datathon, hackathon, and they put a GoPro up in the room that they had, and they set tables up. It was kind of interesting. It was kind of some, uh, you know, l l let's get some requirements in this table, and then there was data ingest, and there was some wrangling over here, and they just kind of set up different tables, and someone sped through the video really fast in a time series that you got to watch it. In the first few hours, as you would expect, everybody's huddled around the requirements table. Then you just saw people just working in their own direction in different stages, and it just, for the next, you know, the rest of the day, it was just shattered. And the things that they came back to people and the recommendations they made at the board level of this company were implemented just from that 16-hour event that they had once, just by letting people add it to get it. So, you know, uh, the other thing that I think, just you mentioned, it was, it was can we get rid of big? It's just data, right? It's advanced analytics on, on data. I think everyone's information is taking care of itself and it's all getting pretty big, but there's value there. Um, thankfully, we can scale to whatever the value is. And obviously, you know, your, your size is pretty large too. And the cyber situation, we had talked about keeping logs to model, but it's just allowing people at the information, I think, for them to come up with ideas about how to improve things in their organization, improve government, improve people's lives. It, it happens when people have that kind of access and, and how they can get at it. Some I think things. there's two takeaways out of that that I would stress. One is um, everyone here has made the point that the more people use the data, the better the data gets. Um, I think it's, it, you know, people who have that context and understand that data are the ones who are going to see something that's an anomaly and they're going to raise the flag to say, is this an error in the data or is this an, an error, like something more upstream at the data source. But uh, a data scientist who doesn't have any domain expertise is not going to see that. Okay. You really need to involve people who understand the data, people from the financial sector or people who are working in the applied physics lab on the programs themselves to help the data improve over time. Um, that's a hard case to make, y'all, in government. There are a lot of people who are afraid that imperfect data sets, when people work on imperfect data sets, um, and you can argue with me later if there's such a thing as a perfect data set, but people are afraid that if you put an imperfect data set out, that people will draw improper conclusions. Um, and it's, it's like a philosophical camp, really. There's two camps, one that says, no data is perfect, educate people on what's there and what's not there, and let them understand um, the fine print, and they will find ways to, to control for that. Other people will say, no, if you put the data out there that it's incomplete, people are gonna take the five second sound bite and they're gonna jump to the wrong conclusion, particularly in data sets that are a little less um, black and white, like the counterterrorism or healthcare, for example, um, where you can see things in a couple of different ways. And so if you're in government or working with government, I wouldn't underestimate um, the power of those two camps. And, and, help, and you should understand where your leadership is or where your clients are on that, because it makes a big difference in what their approach would be on data quality, on data monitoring, and on open data. So I suggest definitely knowing that culture I'll give you an illustrative example. Um, we pulled the data together. We're looking at neonatal intensive care unit um, utilization and costs for Medicaid um, across several states. And it was widely disparate between a few different states, just much more NICU use, much higher costs. And you, know, you might say, well, maybe the state's reimbursing at a better rate, a higher rate than this other state is for NICU costs. Or, you know, they have different rules about um, who's in, uh, in, who goes into the neonatal intensive care unit versus who doesn't. Um, well, you know what it actually was? It was the opioid epidemic. It was babies detoxing when they were born in the NICU. And if you overlaid that data on NICU cost with the prevalence of substance abuse addiction, that's what it was. It had nothing to do with the cost for services. It had nothing to do with how they were calculating data. It was the context of understanding that those geographic areas were facing an epidemic that the other comparison states were not at the same scale. 
Would I have seen that as just a simple data person? No. Would he, you know, he have seen that just through his data tables? No. You had to have somebody who actually had content and domain expertise and understood what's going on in healthcare or in, in that setting, or was at least willing to ask the questions rather than to jump to those conclusions. But that's a perfect example of why these two philosophical camps exist. Because you could draw the wrong conclusion from what looked like a perfectly accurate and robust data set. You're always going to have skeptics, right? So, so confidence is always important from whichever side of the fence you were on there, right? There has to be, people have to be willing to act and believe on what may be presented to them, but mm -hmm. um, sometimes they need to know where it came from. They need to know why it's sound. I mean, people think different ways, so there's a lot of ways we, we have to, um, a lot of features we incorporate to make sure that all those kinds of people can be satisfied, because we all think and, a little differently, but we all bring lots of value very right, differently. So we have a few minutes here. I've got a lot of terrific talent here. Wanted to open it up to see if anyone had any questions for any of the panelists that they'd like to ask. We can gauge how hungry people are. Any questions? Go on. Uh, Charles, Charles twisted your arm. He made you come up with two now. We got at least that one. Yes. Uh, this message is for this question is for uh, Ms. Khan. Uh, my question is: You mentioned the lack of strategic planning um, within the area of data and analytics, and we see this frequently across the industry. Organizations have many ideas. Um, rarely are they aligned with the the needs and the use cases. Uh, so my question is: Does CMS in general have strategic plans for data analytics environments? Um, is that is that something of a a need internally? It's a great question. I don't know that I can answer for all of CMS. Um, I would say for Medicaid, we have a strategic plan, which um, was really complex. Get the data, <laughs> disseminate the data. I mean, it's pretty much understanding that we're collecting all of this data first. We have to bring it in and understand its data quality. And then we have to figure out how to service all those users internally and externally and disseminating it. So the, those are the high level parameters. For the rest of the agency, um, it's as it should be fairly componentized by program and what their needs are. But I also would say, since most of my role is in um, funding what states are doing, um, that it is the rare state that has a strategic plan around their own data and data analytics. There are some, and you'll see them. They're building up their own state capacity. They're hiring data scientists. They're creating cross-component uh, state data analytics teams. Um, but it's the rare state that really sees data as a commodity that they own and should have and are really staffing and resourcing to that. I think it's growing. I think value-based care and delivery reform are certainly pushing that along. Um, as they should be, as well as program integrity. Um, but it is, um, it's often an afterthought. It's often like phase three or four in somebody's system build. Oh, that's when I'll get around to performance data uh, or data that can show me like what's happening where. And that's really unfortunate. That's, it should be front and center. Any other questions? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to um, thank Claudera for having such a diverse panel. It's very useful. Um, and extremely insightful for many of us who are involved in the um, data analytics sector. A couple of questions actually for Jess and for others on this panel. Um, so the Privacy Act, it's just something that all federal agencies have to manage to and deal with. And I'm curious to know from the panelists how that, given that it's somewhat of an outdated document, how that is potentially a a challenge for federal agencies to uh, work with each other in meaningful data use um, exchange, as well as with state agencies. Because as just mentioned, states are really all over the place on this. And really, um, it's important, I think, for the community at large to be thinking about how we can collectively be a voice on some of these issues, um, particularly not just the outdated nature of the Privacy Act, which I'm interested in the panel's um, thoughts on, which is part A of the question. Part B of the question is, how can everybody in this room be a voice for real um, you know, uh, development um, at the federal level, um, cognizant, thoughtful policy towards 
uh, data use um, and the exchange of data across agencies. Thank you. I swear I didn't plant her there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the fact that we're talking about a law that passed in 1974, before there even was the internet or any of the technology that we have been talking about this morning and will continue this afternoon, is inherently challenging because um, a lot of what raises people's concerns around privacy can be addressed in many ways through technology. And that, of course, was not foreseen during the Privacy Act. Um, so it is often a case of trying to um, interpret that law in light of the current world that we live in for data exchange and for data security. And um, that, you know, that keeps us quite busy. I don't know of um, solutions other than um, perseverance, um, dogged perseverance. Um, and sometimes you luck out with your general counsel and um, get some people who have some vision. I would also say um, we haven't talked about um, cross-component data exchange here. We've really been focusing on data work that we're doing intern you know, within our organizations. But you know, what if there was a use case for consumer and financial data to be paired up with healthcare data? Um, it would be no small feat for us to arrange how to do that data transfer. Um, and so I would say in terms of how to be the voice, we should have a, and, and there are agencies that do this better than, than us, but we should have a data exchange first policy. That means my default position is if he needs the data, the Medicaid data, or Carol from OIG who was here before me, then I should default to yes. And then if it turns out that there's privacy or security or other reasons that I can't, then so be it. But that's very different than the way it operates now, which is typically a default to no. There's 100 reasons why that's hard or I can't do it. Um, and that's, that requires, again, a culture change. <clears throat> so thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you to all of our panelists here. We, we've run out of time here. Um, this afternoon's terrific lineup. Uh, you want to stick around to, to listen how someone could even transform their industry through analytics. In this case, baseball, and that's a starting out pretty good. Um, be an interesting conversation, but uh, enjoy lunch. But uh, a big hand, thank you very much to our panelists here. Yeah.